The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Kathy Lee, and I'm the junior chair of the Gerontological Society of America's Emerging Scholars and Professional Organization Webinar Task Force. Along with Darina Petrovsky, the past chair of the webinar task force, and Megan McCutcheon, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Non-Academic Careers in Aging. Our GSA ASPO webinar task force team thought that it would be a really good timing to pick this topic given it's a careers in aging week. Our speakers for this webinar are Dr. Mindy Baker, Sonia Barsnis, and Dr. Cynthia Dordi. We'll allow around 15 minutes toward the end of the presentation for questions. You can type your questions through the control panel on your screen in the questions box area at any time during the presentation. You can also contribute today via our Twitter webinar hashtag, which is hashtag CIAW, also found in the bottom of each of our slides. Thank you to our speakers. Um, for their time and effort in preparing this webinar. And thank you to our audience for your attendance. We hope you find this an educational, useful, and meaningful experience. Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Mindy Baker. Dr. Baker is the Director of Education at George G. Glenner Alzheimer's Family Centers. She'll talk about different aspects of non-academic career path based on her own experience. Dr. Mindy Baker. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to Kathy and Darina and Megan for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm always happy to share my experiences and a atypical career path, which um, hopefully sharing some of my experience um, on things I've learned along the way will be helpful to uh, some of you. Uh, my journey starts, um, next slide, please. My journey starts with um, a love for older adults and especially for people with dementia. When I was a, uh, working as a caregiver when I was in college, I stayed um, with a lady named Jane uh, for a couple hours a day. And uh, when I started doing that uh, at work, they just told me, you know, this lady has dementia. She's going to repeat herself and it's okay. And that was the extent of my dementia training. <laughs> and so uh, I learned a lot from Jane. Uh, I learned that she could still play the piano on her own, um, lots of songs from memory. She was in an assisted living community that she just moved into, but she could find her way from the dining room back to her apartment. Um, after a few weeks, she started recognizing me. And so it was um, kind of a puzzle, and I thought, this is really interesting to see what she can still do. And then that fall, I had a cognitive psych class, and it all kind of unfolded and made sense. You know, I, I learned about different types of memory and how, um, you know, well, explicit and declarative memory could be impaired, procedural memory could still be intact, and um, just lots of different things um, about cognition. And I thought this would be so helpful for the caregivers. And and why aren't we getting this kind of information in the hands of people who are are taking care of people with dementia on a regular basis? And so that kind of started um, my path of um, going into to dementia, and um, I went to Akron, University of Akron, and the Applied Cognitive Aging Program, and uh, it was focused on all aspects of cognitive aging, but whenever the opportunity arose to um, take a class specifically on Alzheimer's and or other types of dementia and um, cognitive neuropsych and internships, um, I, I participated in all those and was also doing research um, on looking at, at um, different aspects of cognition and looking at how you can modify a task so that you're um, compensating for the deficits but kind of maximizing um, the abilities that remain intact and um, still trying to kind of figure out um, what, how, what, would, what would my path look like next because most of the people in my program were planning on going into academics and um, while I loved doing the research and the academic side of it, I still really wanted to be able to make that um, connection with people in the applied world. And there wasn't really a clear path on how to do that. So as I was trying to figure that out, um, 
I worked at other places. I worked at Creative Action um, with Dr. Harvey Stearns, who was um, my doctoral advisor, and his wife, um, who owned the company. And they worked on, um, we had a lot of small business innovative research grants, and we, um, a lot of that was related to products specifically for older adults, uh, and some of them even for dementia. So that was a, a great experience. <clears throat> um, I also worked at Ohio Wesleyan University uh, as a project manager for a National Institute on Aging grant on cognitive aging and maintenance of knowledge, which was also uh, a great experience. It was um, because Ohio Wesleyan's an undergrad university, um, it, it looked kind of different. It started as a five-year grant and kind of turned into a 10-year grant. So all of a sudden, I kind of had this 10-year postdoc, which is pretty unusual. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, um, so in all of that, I was still trying to figure out how, how can I make this connection again to the applied community. And so looked into trying to maybe do some consulting to do training or working in nursing homes. But even though I had experience in research and I had done teaching, um, you know, that was not quite enough to necessarily sell myself um, to, to a community for them to actually pay for training. And so um, um, about five years ago, my husband and I um, moved to California because uh, we do missions work in Mexico, and we started that about eight years ago and um, just kind of became more and more of a passion, and so we moved out here. And so as we did that, um, I started looking out here in California for, for experiences and ended up working at an adult day program, um, even as a volunteer to just kind of get reconnected. Uh, working with people with dementia, and then eventually became an administrator of that program. It was a really small program. And then I worked as a um, director of memory care in an assisted living community, um, which was also great experience, but very, very different. So um, as you can see, I haven't had a typical uh, kind of career path at all. Um, and some of it initially didn't, you know, some of it kind of seems like, ah, should I be doing this? Is this is this going to get me where I want to get in the long run? Um, and it has, which is kind of the, the cool piece of it all. Um, so the, the next slide, please. Um, I'm currently working at the George G. Glenner Alzheimer's Family Centers. Um, and Dr. Glenner is the researcher who uh, identified the plaques in the brains of people with Alzheimer's as beta amyloid. And so that was a huge contribution to the field to be able to, to do next steps and to be able to to find animal models and and develop medicines and things and at the same time um, Dr. Glenner was still seeing patients and he and his wife saw this great need for the family members and for the people with dementia that they just didn't they, the family members needed some respite and um, there just weren't programs out there designed for people with dementia and so they created one of the first adult day programs for people with Alzheimer's in the US and um, that was 35 years ago. So um, a key component um, with kind of the background of Dr. Glenner being um, at, U at UCSD and having, um, he was both you know, in the applied world caring for his patients and doing research. And so in um, the organization, education is valued. And so as my, in my position as director of education, I've been able to be part of some great um, projects. We have an e-learning project that's funded by a grant that's with San Diego State and UCSD. So um, there's there's definitely bridging there. Um, I get the opportunity to train our staff who are um, working in our adult day programs. We have three centers currently. And then we also have professional training that I help with. I develop the curriculum and then um, myself and some of my instructors, we do training um, Offsite at assisted living communities or, or whoever um, is interested in having dementia training. Uh, we have free symposia in the community um, and try to work with community partners like Alzheimer's San Diego, Alzheimer's Association um, to really, again, just getting that information into the hands of the people who need it. So <clears throat> um, that's kind of a quick um, look on what, what my um, journey has looked like. And so um, next slide, please. Um, the one other thing I wanted to share about um, Glenner is that we have a new center that will be opening uh, at the end of the month. It's called Town Square and um, super excited about it. Um, 
we have basically taken a warehouse and turned it into a small um, city like of San Diego, thing, rep, things that replicate city San Diego, like the city hall, it looks a lot like um, one of our government buildings and um, Balboa Park tower that um, resembles Balboa Park. Um, and then it's all set in the late 50s so that um, we can capitalize on the long-term memories and um, spontaneous reminiscing. And then we'll have programming in each of the storefronts. And one of the um, core values of Glenner has been to have a five to one ratio. So um, five participants, for every five participants, we have a staff member who's working with them. Um, and so we're super excited about this. It's um, the first adult day program center like this um, pretty much anywhere. And um, so this has just been another component where I've gotten a chance to speak into the design and the programming of, and what's going to go on there, which has been uh, really exciting because I'm pretty much the only one with um, an academic background who's who's an employee of Town Square. Um, we have others speaking into the project from UCSD and San Diego State as well. So, um, and uh, we're excited. Maria Shriver came out, and so if you want to know more about Town Square, uh, April 10th, she's going to do a little spot on the Today Show. So um, we're super excited about that. Uh, next. Um, so based on my experience, hopefully um, uh, some things that I, I I tried to think through what are some things I've learned in the process and what might be helpful for you. Um, and I think one of the things is just, first of all, to kind of enjoy the journey. Sometimes we're really focused on getting to the end goal and we miss out on um, what's going on in the present. And, um, you know, all of our journeys are different. And through the, the process, there's always good and bad. And um, I've had to learn that even through the bad experiences, we can learn from it. Um, maybe it's learning what not to do or how to make things better, um, but it's definitely more valuable to to try to look at it as an opportunity of, uh, to learn something um, rather than to, to just be frustrated with, with it. Um, one of the things I think that's really important in, in being able to enjoy the journey is being able to know yourself. And I think sometimes, um, it's easy to get consumed by our work or what we do as part of our identity. And so I think it's to keep perspective, it's important to realize that our career or um, the work path is just a part of who we really are. And um, what we do is a part of who we are and remembering all the other things that are important to us um, are super valuable too. So that when something doesn't go right, um, it helps to keep it in perspective and it's not, um, we don't feel like oh, we're a failure or we can't do something very well or, you know, just all of that pressure to do. I know in, in grad school, it just seemed like we had to kind of do everything perfect and there was lots of pressure to get things published and do research and school and teach. And um, it, it was easy for that to get overwhelming and it helped um, to kind of step back and look at the big picture and where I wanted to end up eventually and how these pieces were going to help me get there. Um, and so part of that was was kind of understanding um, strengths. And so I think for all of us, it's helpful to know what we're good at and what we're not good at. And instead of trying to do everything and learn how to do everything perfect, to kind of realize there are some things that I'm not so great at and that's okay. And to kind of pair up with other people who have those strengths and work together um, to be able to admit it's okay, I'm not good at everything. And then you can really focus on those things that you are good at. And uh, one of the things I discovered that even though consulting works for a lot of people, that didn't work for me because um, although I'm good at working with people with dementia and their family members, and even training, I'm not so good at the business side of things and trying to sell myself and do marketing. And so for me, that wasn't a, a good fit. Um, when I worked in memory care, uh, again, the, the aspect of working with the people with dementia was great, but trying to do all the administrative work in terms of you know, managing our staff, doing their scheduling, doing budgets, doing incident reports, um, those were just not things that are necessarily my strengths. And the other thing is I wasn't really passionate about those things. Um, and so that made work more difficult. And um, 
another piece of, of that position for me was kind of, um, it didn't fit into what my ideal lifestyle was. That, that job was so demanding, it was easily 80 to 90 hours of work per week. Um, and I had to step back and although I was able to learn a lot from it, that wasn't kind of where I wanted to stay. Um, because I had other things that were important to me and I wanted to be able to spend more time with family and more time doing uh, the missions work in Mexico. So that was part of me kind of figuring out um, on this journey where I needed to end up or wanted to end up. Um, the other thing that I've learned is that um, it's nice when we can have a direct path. Um, you know, a lot of my um, classmates in grad school were you know, it was, okay, we're going to do, you know, four years, have the dissertation done, be, graduate, and then apply to however many positions and go be um, a professor at a university. And so the steps were pretty clear what, what they needed to do. My path was not nearly that clear. Um, I was looking and do I need to be licensed to be able to do behavioral interventions with people with Alzheimer's or, you know, do, do I need to take extra classes to do that? And where would I find an internship? And should I even be doing it? And so exploring all these different things um, and then doing all these different jobs. And I've discovered that um, indirect paths are sometimes really valuable. Um, and, and it's sometimes um, taking the indirect paths that actually help us kind of better understand and appreciate um, the destination that that we're headed for. Um, so instead of being kind of frustrated by that, um, sometimes look at that as it's, again, it's an opportunity and it's something that you can learn from. Uh, <clears throat> my other piece of advice would be don't try to fit into somebody else's box. Um, if you have, you know, a passion for something and you're good at it and you want to do something, but it's not exactly clear how to get there or what to do, um, just be persistent with it. Uh, when I moved here to California, asking for a job, there were research positions, which were, you know, like project manager type jobs for grants. And there were things in the applied world, like activity director positions, which I was overqualified for. Um, but I was even applying to those because I, I just wanted to get back in touch working with people with dementia. And people interviews when I would have those I just didn't fit in their boxes because I had had this 10 years of experience on a research grant plus other grant background and um, that didn't kind of fit most research people applying for the research project manager type positions were more likely to be recent grads um, and in the applied world that they didn't under even though I'd done lots of activities and had experience with people with dementia they saw research and to them that meant no you haven't you don't really know how to work with people with dementia and so um, I realized I wasn't going to fit in, in any of their boxes and to just kind of keep pursuing what I really wanted which was working with people with dementia and doing training and that kind of opened up um, the opportunity to work at the adult day program um, where I worked as a volunteer and then eventually was able to become the administrator. And so sometimes that's, you know, having to maybe even humble yourself and, and take a position that is low paying just to get that in to be able to eventually get um, um, not even the experience because maybe you have the experience, but for others to recognize that you have the experience and to be able to ultimately get into that position. Uh, next slide. And uh, just a few, um, they've asked us to give cons as well as the pros to the non-academic career. And I honestly, I couldn't come up with too many cons for me. Uh, one of them I, I think would be just the, um, the atmosphere of a university and being able to, on a daily basis, know the most recent up-to-date research that's going on and be able to talk in detail um, most people in the applied world, you know, they don't care about, uh, you know, the p-value of a research study and um, nor even necessarily know what that means. Um, so just being able to have other people that are like-minded to be able to share, you know, um, new and exciting things going on um, in terms of research. And, um, and then the other kind of a, a con is just in the applied world having to understand that most of the time it's a business and so um, if you don't have like special grant funding or something then 
it can be challenging if you want to try to do research. And so sometimes things skip that research step. And so even I love our town square and we've based it on existing research. There are th new, th new aspects about it that have never been tested. And, and so that was hard for me to kind of recognize like, well, we're just gonna do it and then kind of figure it out as we go to some extent, you know, exactly how somebody's gonna react in this environment because no one's ever done it, we don't know. Um, we can make predictions based on other things that we know from research. Um, and so, so that's been a little bit of a challenge of, of that blending of, um, in the business world, they don't test everything before they do it. Um, and so, um, so that's you know potentially a con, but there's also benefit to that as well. So, um, and definitely the benefits of my non-academic career have outweighed my uh, cons. Uh, it's amazing opportunity that I have to be able to bridge the gap and take information to people who um, who really need this to be able to talk to a caregiver who is at her wit's end because she just doesn't know what to do with her loved one and to talk to her for 15 minutes and just give her some information and help her understand things from the perspective of the person with dementia or give her some suggestions on things that she can change and modify and it you know totally changes her mindset for the day and gives her some some help um, and then you know caregivers professional care caregivers too, just being able to share that information and know that that it's helping them and it's making things better and therefore being able to have that direct impact. Um, so I, I love being able to do that. <clears throat> Another benefit is just having a different perspective to offer to my organization. Um, there are people who are coming from the applied setting who have, you know, maybe they're good at doing the things that they do, but they don't necessarily know the background to why that works. Um, or to understand a disease process of Alzheimer's and how that's really affecting things and to be able to explain that to someone um, and have them learn through that process um, is a great opportunity as well. And then uh, it, for me, it's, it's been great to be able to have flexibility. My job is actually part-time um, and my boss is amazing and he's kind of, you know, let me create my position of what it looks like and, um, days and times and and there's lots of flexibility there that allows me to be able to do other things that I love to do. Um, so for me, uh, this has been a long journey, but it's been great um, to be able to have the different experiences and for those to kind of all blend together into uh, what I'm able to do now. So um, hopefully some of that information is is helpful for you all and I think we're going to do questions at the end. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next is Ms. Sonia Barthness. Um, she's a gerontologist, consultant, speaker, entrepreneur, and a blogger. So she works with organizations that support people growing older and growing with dementia to ensure that person-centered education, research, policy, and practice truly reflect what is important to the people they serve. Um, so given the limited time, we'll um, strictly have 12 minutes for the um, the next two speakers. Thank you. Okay, meet Sonia Barthnitz. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you all today. And certainly listening to Dr. Baker's um, path is, resonates with me. As you'll see, there's we have some similarities. Um, next slide. So thinking outside the box is a common theme for my path as well. Um, in a nutshell, I, I tell people I started in the field of gerontology when I was 11 because I started volunteering in my neighborhood, uh, volunteering with elders. And then in college, um, my, my degree was under, my undergraduate degree was in psychology with minors in gerontology and biology. And that's really when I discovered the field of gerontology. And like Dr. Baker also volunteered with a lot of different organizations to kind of find my place. Place. Um, after college, I started working in a nursing home um, in social services and then did neuropsych testing. I was trying to find my path at that point and thought that I was going to go into more clinical path, actually. Um, then I, I went and got my master's degree and uh, decided to work again in the field as a provider and so worked in assisted living and nursing homes 
then I decided that I wanted to have a, a larger impact. So I decided to go into a nursing home and assisted living policy for a while, worked at Leading Age and some other organizations, and then worked in the community with the Alzheimer's Association, area agencies on aging, county offices on aging. So I really, in terms of my work history, kind of spanned the continuum of aging services. And then about nine or 10 years ago, I, I, I felt that I w it was be very difficult for me to find a job that was going to truly enable me to combine all of my interests and to kind of span research, education, policy, practice. So I decided to start my own consulting business that could span this. And my I, I have kind of a specific interest as well in long-term care, person-centered care specifically, and person-centered dementia care. And so starting my consulting consulting business allowed me to kind of bridge all these things together. In the meantime, I also did have one foot in academia through adjunct work at Virginia Commonwealth University Department of Gerontology. So I was able to teach, I was able to do some research with them as well, but my primary work has always been outside academia. Um, next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about my business. So my mission has been professionally to change the culture of aging and long-term care. And so my business is, is related to really taking the perspective of people who are growing older and growing with dementia and infusing this into education, research, policy, and practice. Um, and this, uh, contributes, I guess, to this paradigm shift that I've been trying to do. And that is kind of the focus of my business. Next slide. And then just to give you more of the nuts and the bolts of what I actually do in my work. So my clients are nursing homes, assisted living communities, CCRCs, all types of residential care communities, as well as nonprofits, um, government organizations, uh, a lot of different clients. I don't, my clients are not individuals, like individuals with dementia or family members, they're more organizations. And the three areas that I do consulting in are person-centered care, long-term care, and dementia care. And the areas through which I consult are education. Um, I do curriculum development, speaking engagements, training um, all over the country for various types of organizations and audiences. Everything from teaching CNAs and nursing homes how to care for people with dementia to more professional audiences, um, uh, which you're doing kind of more unpacking actually research related to dementia and person-centered care. Uh, second area is evaluation. So I do research, actually. I do different types of research. I do more traditional, quasi-experimental type of research. I also do a lot of kind of program evaluation, applied research. Um, and then the third area is practice. So I work with organizations to help them to do better in terms of caring for older people and for people with dementia. And so my consulting business has allowed me to kind of work in those three different areas in many different ways, which has been very exciting for me. And that, like I said, I've been doing it for about nine years now. And um, there is a kind of a, there is a network of consultants in aging. So it has been also wonderful to have that as a collaborative um, pool that I often work with. Uh, the second thing that I more recently have been working on is I started a blog and it's called Being Heard, the Voice of a Revisionary Gerontologist. And that is really an effort also to contribute to this paradigm shift in aging and kind of lending my voice from a different perspective to the field of aging. And you know, as, as Dr. Baker alluded to as well, is there are a lot of people in aging services that actually are not gerontologists. So they don't have the, um, not just the scientific background, but I guess the theoretical background as well. And so I think gerontologists lend such an important perspective to aging services, regardless of it being academic or non-academic. And I've tried to infuse that into everything I've done, including this blog. So I certainly encourage you to check it out because it has some interesting thoughts about gerontology and aging. Um, I have some other businesses um, that I'm beginning to start, some entrepreneurial ideas that I'm able to do through my business. Um, and uh, they are also related to all those areas of dementia, long-term care, and uh, person-centered care. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of pros and cons of being in a non-academic career, I would say for me the pros are that this allowed me to have a much broader perspective. I was able to develop the experiences and skills in various areas of gerontology, both from an applied perspective, but also from a research and a policy and education perspective. So it really has allowed me to, um, to dabble into lots of different things. And I would say earlier in my career, this was particularly important because I really wanted to experience as much as possible. And it allowed me to have a much broader view in terms of what was out there and what I might be interested in. And so it, it allowed me also not to kind of put myself in a box to really spread myself out to to many different things and see what kind of stuck with me and what resonated with me. Uh, this My path has also allowed me, particularly being a consultant and having my own business, of having tremendous flexibility. So I do have uh, some a good degree of flexibility about the types of projects I want to work on. So not just in terms of focus areas, but partners, um, types of projects, extent of projects. So it does allow you a lot of autonomy. Clearly, my work is heavily applied, and that has been a huge pro for me because, like Dr. Baker, I just really, really enjoyed working directly with elders, with people with dementia, with family caregivers, and to be kind of out there in the field, and so I've been able to do that. At the same time, I've also been able to kind of keep a foot in research so that I can be a part of research projects, research studies, and also keep up on research. So it's actively a part of my world to be looking at research. And in fact, in my kind of more applied world, I am considered the bridge. People often do kind of look to me sometimes to be able to infuse the research perspective as well, because in many cases, providers don't have access to that research. Um, just having my own business has also, for me, created a lot of autonomy. So um, both personally and professionally, uh, I, it's, been, it's just allowed me to kind of create my own path. And another thing that I have found is that there are other independent researchers out there as well. So in terms of the research components of my consulting, we have kind of found each other and we have like a loose network of independent researchers that share information and often work together. And that's been also really exciting to meet other people that are in similar situations. I guess another pro is that this, and it's sort of a piece of advice, is to expose yourself as much as possible to all the different facets of gerontology and aging, whether uh, you're a student or emerging professional, professional or in the field, that it, it's, I think it just benefits you regardless of the scope of your practice um, to really have that broad view and to see what else is out there and to see things from different perspectives. Next slide, please. And also, in terms of cons, I don't necessarily see this as particularly negative, but there are, I guess, um, maybe challenges is that it can be difficult at times to conduct research, especially as a lead, but it's not impossible. Um, I, I've had maybe a couple of instances in which the um, as an applicant, they preferred to have a PhD or an academic, but for the most part, it has not been a barrier for me. Uh, in terms of grant funding, there are a number of grants in aging that are not targeted towards academia and researches. Although there may be a researcher on the team, uh, particularly for program evaluation, so there actually are a significant amount of uh, grant resources out there, like retirement research, um, CMP funds, SBIR, NIH opportunities, Commonwealth, et cetera. And, you know, it does sometimes help to have academic affiliations for grants in terms of legitimacy, but I really just haven't found it to be a barrier for me. And I think perhaps also because I have had an adjunct status so that I've been able to kind of use that um, connection at times. I would say probably the greatest challenge has been IRB. If you're conducting research and you're not affiliated with an academic institution is that you have to be a little creative at times to be able to find IRB. Um, other cons are there have been times I have felt that because for me particularly I didn't have a PhD and I wasn't a part of an academic institution that I was not considered an expert. 
Um, but this really has not been common. It's just, and it's not been problematic. Um, one of the things it actually has done is it has forced me to make my case about my knowledge about a content area and to kind of prove that I do know what I'm talking about. So it's not necessarily been a con, but it has just been something that I've had to be aware of. At the same time, in my in my world, in long-term care and person-centered care, not having a PhD and not being a part of an academic organization has also served me in a positive way way because I have been seen as more um, applied and um, more kind of in the real world, quote unquote. And I would say, you know, another con-ish, but not really, um, is that I've had to actively keep up research skills and actively keep up with research and professional knowledge. So it hasn't been built into my environment, but I have to actively seek it out. For me, because I like to geek out on all this stuff, that's been great, but it is something that um, not all people may uh, want to do. So um, that's uh, the information I have. I'm always happy to answer questions. I know we will be at the end, and I just encourage you all to find your own path and to find your own way, because there's tons of stuff out there that needs to have gerontological influence. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Last but not least, Dr. Cynthia Doherty is the Director of the Office of Geriatric and Interprofessional Aging Studies at The Ohio State University. She'll share her advice that she shares with her own students daily, specifically about course planning and different career paths in aging. Dr. Cynthia Doherty? Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> Um, thank you all for having me. I am excited to share a little bit about my story. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, we were on the same page, I think, us panelists, even though we did not prepare together um, in thinking about our direct and indirect paths and our winding roads. Um, so certainly for me, it, uh, this was also a winding road to the career um, where I am now. Um, for those of you who are not from Ohio or the Midwest, um, I am a Buckeye at Ohio State, um, but before that, I was a Bobcat uh, at Ohio University. And when I was there, um, I always knew that I wanted to go to grad school, but I didn't know what for exactly. Um, and so I had one of those nondescript uh, majors, you know, political science, actually. Um, and, you know, I continued to think about what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to... Um, work for vulnerable populations and potentially do advocacy and, and sort of macro level work. Um, but again, I still wasn't sure. And so what I did uh, afterwards was um, a year of AmeriCorps. And uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with uh, AmeriCorps, but essentially it's like a domestic version of the Peace Corps. And so I did that. And uh, during that year, I came to know some social workers and decided that that was the route that I wanted to take. Um, at this time, I still wasn't thinking specifically about the field of aging um, as I got my MSW. Uh, and even, you know, as I started my PhD program, I was still pretty open in terms of thinking about the types of work that I uh, wanted to do. So for me that, you know, those times uh, were really about trying to find connections, um, about relationship building, and I was really trying to keep an open mind about, you know, what my social work uh, career would look like. And, you know, I was trying to tie everything back that I was doing to my personal experiences. Um, I grew up around older adults in a way that I think many uh, Asian Americans do. So I'm a Filipino, first, born, first generation born here in the States. And uh, what that meant was that when my mother was pregnant with me, her parents came from the Philippines to live with us. Um, and my uh, dad's mother came and lived with us for a period of time. And so I just thought that that was a normal thing. Um, it didn't occur to me until much later in my life that everybody didn't have their grandparents living with them. Um, you know, when we went to other people's houses, they were all intergenerational households as well. Um, and, I, and I remember thinking at one point in time that my mom, who was an RN, mentioned, um, mentioned that in the Philippines, there really weren't any nursing homes. And I didn't really understand what she meant by that. I was familiar with nursing homes because we volunteered through school and things like that. And it, it didn't really occur to me, um, you know, what, what that meant. And I started thinking about that more and more uh, through my PhD work. Um, I mentioned that, you know, as I was 
kind of thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do, I knew that I would be able to develop skills in lots of different settings um, and that I could develop skills that would apply in lots of different settings, you know, as I continue to move on. Uh, and so I, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, through my MSW work, after I finished, I was able to work in the areas of housing, in community-based services, um, in senior supportive services. But even at that time, for me, um, you know, it wasn't, a, uh, the field of aging wasn't a focus, I should say. Uh, and so, again, I sort of came to this um, later into, into my career. Uh, next slide, please. So I was doing lots of different work, again, and, and building all of these different types of skills. Um, and what I realized was that, you know, I needed to sort of be a little bit more willing to uh, think about taking risks. And so this is one thing that I uh, tell students all the time as they think about preparing, you know, the idea that, um, you know, variety is a really good thing, that having lots of different kinds of skills is a really good thing. Um, and thinking about, particularly in the field of aging, that, you know, it's happening in lots of different settings. So it's not just about, you know, being in long-term services or supports or being in hospitals or, you know, some of these other areas, but that there are lots of different ways that you can work, um, that you can work in the field of aging. So I tell students, you know, in terms of being willing to take risk to, you know, ask a lot of questions, um, take advantage of your, you know, student status. Uh, a lot of times, once we get to a job, you know, we feel like we can't ask all of the questions that we want to ask. And so, you know, take it, take advantage of being able to say, you know, I'm a student, I don't quite understand, you know, why are you doing this that way? Or isn't there some research that says that there's a better way to do this? Um, you know, and, and being willing sometimes to challenge the folks that you are coming across uh, and working with in a respectful way uh, and being able to share, you know, the things that you're learning. Um, I think it's really important to learn from those who, who, you know, are different from you. So you may not be in uh, gerontology specifically, but, you know, you might be in occupational therapy or in nursing. And so it's really important, as you know, obviously gerontology is an interprofessional field already. Uh, and so it's a really good idea, you know, to uh, be purposeful about who you're learning from. So if you have the opportunity to take electives, you know, in other areas, uh, do that, you know, try to take different kinds of coursework and try to be really uh, purposeful, again, about, you know, all, each of those decisions. Um, I think that, and I understand why, in academia we ask, you know, students to be really focused, uh, and I think that sometimes we do that to the detriment of learning other things. Uh, it's important to keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities, so they're not always very obvious. Uh, and sometimes we have to work on, you know, making those opportunities uh, ourselves if we can't find them. Think about, you know, collaboration. Um, think about, you know, your own strengths and, and trying to understand what is it that you can do uh, to develop, to continuing develop those strengths, but then also to develop those areas where you need improvement. And again, oftentimes you can do that by connecting and collaborating with people who are maybe in fields that are a little bit different from yours. Next slide, please. So I mentioned thinking broadly uh, about coursework, about disciplines, about the types of experiences that you can have. Uh, and I think, again, that that is true uh, about all of the types of ways that you can prepare. Um, you know, some of our speakers already have mentioned this, that, that there is a need for, uh, for folks to be, you know, doing this, this aging work in, in, again, lots of different areas. And so I think that that's something that we don't always uh, talk about in the field. Um, you know, I think that in terms of these transferable skills that we can learn, we can learn those again from lots of different places. So there was a question uh, that was submitted, for example, about grant writing. Um, that's a skill that is transferable, you know, in all different areas. It's something that if you have the opportunity to learn while you're in school that I, I definitely recommend. Um, it's something that, you know, if folks can do, uh, you can make yourself, you know, an indispensable uh, employee at an organization if you're good at that. And it's the way then, as was previously mentioned, to be able to try, you know, new uh, opportunities and to be able to try new programming or try to do something different uh, if you can, you know, learn that kind of a skill, for instance. Um, I think that we need to also be willing to fully understand the programs that, you know, 
we want to work in, all the way from you know what it is that frontline staff do to you know what's happening uh, in the administration and how the budget impacts you know the work and all of those sorts of things. So, for example, uh, when I did some work in adult day, I you know spent the first probably couple weeks just kind of shadowing and spending some time with all of the different folks who were involved. So anything that I was, you know, skilled enough to do, um, I did, and, and it helped me to better understand the way that the whole operation worked. So, you know, I helped serve lunch. Um, I called bingo. I helped, uh, you know, with uh, getting folks ready to leave, for example, at the end of the day, and, and so on. And just doing all of those different aspects helped me to really fully understand the program, um, you know, before I... Uh, before I, I sort of took on a, my position in that um, environment. Um, I think that it's also important to, you know, continue to think about new skill development, even, you know, for, for those folks who are mid-career, um, to think about, you know, looking for different kinds of trainings that maybe weren't around uh, at the time that you were in school. There's so many things, I think, that, that we are learning, you know, in academia and in other uh, places. We're learning, you know, so much more now in terms of translational science and, and practice and doing different types of program evaluations. And so I think it's important to continue to, you know, look for different ways to develop your skills. And sometimes, you know, to be the person to offer the training. Um, you know, I know of some folks who do things like trade trainings with different organizations that are in their community. Maybe they have an expert in one area and they know of an expert at another organization. And so they you know, offer to train to uh, trade seminars or trainings and things like that. I think that's also important because networking is such an important thing. And especially for students, you know, I, I am preaching this all the time that, you know, you never know where you're going to end up, where you're going to be looking for a job, where you might need help, uh, you know, as a collaborator on a project. Um, but if you meet someone that you think, you know, you might want to be connected to in the future for any reason, at some point, find an excuse to reach out after that uh, initial meeting. Um, you know, if you get somebody's business card and you just tuck it away somewhere and then, you know, a year later you think that that person could help you, if you haven't reached out in the meantime, it's probably going to be a little bit uh, more difficult to have that conversation. Um, so, you know, find a, an excuse to uh, ask a question or even just to send an email and say, hey, it was nice to meet you at the such and such seminar. Um, I enjoyed talking to you about X, Y, Z, and, you know, then if you need to email them six months down the road, you, you know, can reply to that email and kind of jog the memory of the person that, that you had that conversation with. Um, so you're probably wondering why uh, I'm included in this panel since I actually am with an academic organization, um, but really my position um, straddles the line between an academic and non-academic career, I would say. And so I think that that's, uh, that's a part of the reason that I was asked. Um, my position currently, uh, which is part of the College of Medicine here at Ohio State, um, is as the Director of the Office of Geriatrics and Interprofessional Aging Studies. Uh, and again, that word interprofessional um, is a mouthful, but it's really important to the work that uh, we're doing here. Um, I get to work with community partners all the time to plan education for professionals and for students. Uh, but I also get to support students and faculty and support uh, research that's happening in the field of aging, uh, work on program evaluations, uh, and I advise a lot of students who are completing an interdisciplinary specialization in aging here. Um, you know, I really enjoy that I get to spend time out at Champion uh, Intergenerational Center. Uh, it's sort of my opportunity to refresh and actually get some face time uh, with some older adults and, you know, to sort of uh, step away from the administration and those sorts of things uh, and, you know, take a little bit of break from the numbers. Um, but again, it's really nice that I, that I, that my position is uh, something where I feel very connected to practice, but also um, still connected to um, academia. Next slide, please. Um, I know we're going to take some questions. So the only thing that I'll say about this slide is uh, in the version that you have a uh, as a PDF. If you click on this, it will take you to connecttotheages.com. And uh, there are some stories there of young people across the country about, you know, the opportunities that they have learned about in the field of aging. I think this is a good example, uh, this picture, you know, showing all of these people in different fields and different areas, but they all work, 
you know, uh, to, uh, they all work in the field of aging to, you know, be a benefit to, to work with and to, uh, you know, help support um, older adults. And so, um, so I think it's a, a neat thing to check out. Um, and then I want to mention one more thing, and that is that in all of these things in terms of preparation, and I think Dr. Uh, Baker mentioned this a little bit, self-care is extremely important. So I'll just say that, you know, as you're thinking about all of these things and you're, uh, you know, not putting yourself in other people's boxes and you're individualizing your own path, um, that you do all of those things with the idea of self-care in mind. Because um, as we know, we need to take care of ourselves, uh, you know, to be a useful resource to others. Um, I will go ahead and stop there. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Dorina Petrovsky, as Kathy mentioned, and I am the past chair for the webinar task force. I'm going to be guiding you through the questions and answer portion of our webinar, which we have about 10 minutes um, to devote to. Um, there were a few number of questions submitted ahead of time, um, so I'm going to start with those. Um, the, there were a couple of questions related to the policy um, jobs, so jobs in the policy arena in aging, and um, I would actually refer um, those participants uh, who wanted um, to learn more about it to our aging and policy webinar um, that we had um, a couple of months ago that's on our website and that has really has plenty of information on um, policy and aging job opportunities. Um, the first question um, I have is for any of our speakers um, is what are the sources for finding non-academic job in gerontology? And what, what criteria do you use to gauge whether a certain opportunity is a good fit for you? So anybody, um, Mindy, Sonia, Cynthia. Well, I would say um, a lot of it, and um, um, the other speakers have brought this up too, just the importance of kind of networking and, and connecting with people and um, doing that outside of, of academics, um, you know, if it's whatever that specialty is, if it's dementia, you know, connect with the local organizations that are um, involved in dementia care, because it's likely that the people in the local organizations may or may not be connected to the local universities. And so um, reaching out to them um, gives you an opportunity to, one, see more of what they're doing, and then also um, once they know who you are and what you're interested in, then that kind of opens you up to know more about what those opportunities are. Uh, I would echo that. And I think another thing I would add is, again, not to be afraid to ask, um, you know, to ask to be involved or to ask if there is an opportunity. I think uh, the vast majority of folks apply for jobs that, you know, they don't necessarily know a whole lot about what the position looks like day to day. And it's hard to do that after you're not a student to, to find that out or when you're already applying for the job. Um, so one thing, you know, that I tell students to do is if you think one day you might want to work at a place like the Alzheimer's Association, you know, give them a call and say, hey, I'm a student. I'm interested in this work. People in the field of aging are so uh, welcome, welcoming to, to other folks who are interested. And so I think, you know, saying, could I shadow someone for a couple hours? Could I come in and talk about you know, the type of work you do as an executive director or as a, you know, uh, you know, you name the position um, that, you know, people will be willing to have those conversations. And again, take advantage of your student status if, if you are one now to be able to do that. And yeah, this is Sonia. I totally agree. Um, I think key is exposing yourself to as much as possible and to making those connections as much as possible and as early as possible. I also would say, you know, if you have a specific uh, area of interest that you're thinking about to, you know, specifically target those national organizations as well as local organizations, um, like for example, I mean, there, there really are a large number of aging national organizations like National Council on Aging and Leading Age and American Healthcare Association and all these other organizations out there that um, are, I think, a great first step in many cases uh, for getting into a non-academic field because of the breadth of what they do. So I would say to just target those specifically and go to their website and, you know, also call them, have conversations with them and just kind of see what it is that they're doing out there in the world and, and involving yourself in that. 
did have a question um, related to, you know, what advice do you have for students who want to gain experience, I guess, in non-academic careers before graduation? And I believe if you you guys just addressed it. Um, I have a question for Sonia. Um, I believe you talk, you're the one who talked about the independent researcher network, correct? Um, so yes. can you speak a little more about it? The question is how can we find um, the independent researcher network if we're planning to transition to non-academic careers? That's a very great question and I would say my what I have found thus far is that it is an informal network right now. It's not been formalized in the United States. In other countries, they do have actually formalized networks of independent researchers. I have not yet found an, an a formal one in the U.S. specifically in aging research. But um, what I would say is it is a partially networking. I think at this point, I'm also happy to try to connect um, anybody to the researchers that I know that are independent if they'd like to just find out more about what they do. Um, for me, it has been that of really just kind of networking and talking to different people out there. Some of the, um, I guess, more think tank type of aging organizations that are not associated with academic organizations um, tend to have some of those more independent researchers um, like uh, the PCORI or there's Donahue Foundation or some uh, not Rothschild. There's a couple of foundations out there that I think have drawn independent researchers, but I'm happy to talk to anyone specifically about connections. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question um, for any of our speakers, um, and this might be um, a little more vulnerable. I, I don't know how to explain it, but the question is, is financial sustainability ever a struggle for you? Can you repeat the question, actually, because sure. I wanna make sure I'm understanding. Um, the question says, is financial sustainability ever a struggle for you? So I'm assuming this person is asking, um, in your non-academic career, do you ever struggle financially? Um, this is Sonia. I'm happy to answer that first. Uh, um, as, a, a, as a consultant, I think um, you're because you don't have a consistent source of income, there are ebbs and flows. Um, I would certainly be honest with that. Um, when I teach to when I talk to students about entrepreneurial gerontology, and I try to be really clear about that. That in in the entrepreneurial world, that is just a function of that. Um, so there are times in which yes, you are making less money than others. And and I, and for me, what I have had to find as a balance between um, jobs that I guess are more consistent and maybe even jobs that I guess I would say are more lucrative with other types of jobs that maybe make less money. And I think that's just a balance each person finds for themselves. Um, this is Cynthia. Uh, I, I would also add actually that I think a lot of people have come to um, careers in aging because maybe there were opportunities that that would help with um, financial stability. So, uh, for example, I come across folks all the time who were in different areas uh, or different lines of work, but who are now in aging because they found particularly anything that can be tied to healthcare. Uh, in a lot of ways, you know, there's uh, a little bit more um, sustainability there. Um, now, of course, there are things are always changing in terms of uh, what that looks like and and what people are willing to pay for and, and you know obviously insurance and Medicare and Medicaid and so on and so forth but um, but you know I tell students that I think if you are interested in this field that you'll always be able to find work <laughs> um, so you know whatever that means and uh, it, you know will be different for different folks but um, but I yeah but I think that I think that it can be a very um, stable field financially uh, you know for a lot of people um, this is Mindy. I would uh, say that there have been some times where it was um, a little more challenging and uh, some of the jobs were lower paying. Um, but just as uh, um, everyone shared that it, the field of aging is growing and there is such a great need that um, you know, you're, you're very likely to find opportunities. Great. Um, we are um, just a couple of minutes away from um, the end of the webinar. Um, there were a couple of questions that were asked directly 
um, towards one or two speakers. So if the speakers are okay, I can forward you those questions and the um, person's information to follow up if they would like. Um, but I w just wanted to thank everybody again, to all our speakers and to all the audience for your attendance. Uh, we hope you found this an educational, um, useful and meaningful experience. This webinar was recorded and it will be placed online along with the PDF version of the final slides on the gerum.org website. Uh, we also ask you to fill out the post-webinar survey uh, that should pop up after you exit the webinar. And filling this survey out will really help us with planning future webinars and our future work. Uh, once again, thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you in future installments of the GSA um, ESPO um, and Professionals Organization Webinar Task Force. Have a great day. Thank you.